problem is that Credit Suisse, by some standards, might be too big to fail, but also too big to be saved. This stock has been in a huge uh, downfall for two years. So there are clearly problems within this particular institution. We simply don't know the degree to which this is systemic or isolated. This is a global bank. There might be counterparty risk uh, for some of the U.S. banks. If one gets into trouble, people very quickly start looking, oh, what's the next one that looks remotely like this? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a moment overnight. 1.45 a.m. Zurich time, that statement dropped. Credit Suisse tapping the Swiss National Bank for as much as 50 billion Swiss francs. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance starting just a, a little bit earlier on a busy day for you. Equity futures totally unchanged on the S&P 500. Credit Suisse stock anything but unchanged. Tom, that stock is up by about 20%. Uh, the, I think it's, it's wrong here. It's not up here. It's the first print, the first enthusiasm off the SMB news. And now where is it? It's down 13% from the opening move an hour or so ago. So we had the surge, John, and now we're coming down in a measured and orderly manner, and we'll see where we set out through the morning. The top shareholder, the Saudi National Bank, caught up with uh, CNBC a little bit earlier this morning. Everything's fine now. <laughs> Everything's fine. Just to be clear, they've cleared that up. I'll, I'll share the quote with you. It's panic, a little bit of panic, I believe completely unwarranted, whether it be for Credit Suisse or for the entire market after his comments to Bloomberg yesterday when he was asked if he'd provide more assistance if needed. Two words, absolutely, absolutely. not. <laughs> Honestly, what kind of phone calls were behind this walk back? That's my question. And what was the conversation with the CEO of Credit Suisse and the uh, <sighs> chair of the Saudi National Bank after that conversation? I wonder if they said to him, look, you better get out there. You better do something soon. And his own shareholders were well, saying, really? This is a huge part of our investments. What the are we sequence doing? of events yesterday was amazing. You just watched the reporting from the team here at Bloomberg, elsewhere at the Journal, the FT. The FT came out with a report yesterday that Credit Suisse was asking, almost pleading with the Swiss regulator, the Swiss National Bank, to come out and have yeah. a public show of support. And we finally got that statement, Tom, late into the afternoon here in the United States. No, we got the statement there, and we'll go over that, with the ramifications of it, what it means for the accounting statements and profitability and future of this beleaguered bank. But to me, the most important phone call... I think it's speculation, but it's in the zeitgeist with the ECB meeting today. 1-800-PARIS. Hi, incoming, Mr. Macron. Hello. Yeah. Because BNP Paribas is not Credit Suisse and Sakjen is not Credit Suisse. And you wonder what the French government said to various parties in the last 24 hours. And you also wonder how that governing council meeting went <clears throat> at the European Central Bank. That concludes this morning. At least we will get a decision a little bit later. I mean, talk about a rock and a hard place for the ECB after pre-committing to 50 basis points, essentially. What are they going to do? I honestly have no clue. I think that nobody has a clue. Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank puts it out really well, saying, yesterday was a day to look at the screens and really wonder what, as a research analyst, you can really say that helps anyone. <laughs> you are not privy to the conversations behind closed doors. And frankly, I think that yeah. that is very yeah. valid at a time when, what can they say? If they're damned if they do, if they don't raise rates, are they saying that the financial system is that fragile and they're edifying right. some of the concerns? I, I want to just say one thing here before we get to our wonderful set of guests today. And let me tell you, folks, the guests right now, a lot of people can't talk. They're lawyers are saying, uh, you're not going to go on with John Farrell. Bramo, you will not speak to Lisa Abramowitz. <laughs> That's what's going on. For good reason. <laughs> but I want to make clear here just in 30 seconds that there is one thing about a balance sheet liquidity cover, and we'll talk about that into the four hours today, but what's far, far more important here is this is still a profitability question and wealth management is a going concern, and that was not addressed in the last 20 Hours. Not at all. And Tom might go a step further as well. You don't get those kind of statements at 1.45 <clears throat> in the morning, TK, right. these kind of moves from banks when things are good. Things yeah. aren't great right I, now. I got, I, we're not going to do too much of this, but I got a huge response yesterday, the tick by tick. John, the 10-minute interval just broke down on Credit Suisse ever so slightly. We're not back to where we were yesterday, but it's a, it's a chart looking for a bid right now. Well, it was halted, so I believe it's resumed trading. So we are a little bit higher, but way off. Session highs. We're higher now by 19% on Credit Suisse. The fact is, we've just about reclaimed a two handle on the name. So we'll keep an eye on that for you. Here's the broader market at the moment. Equity futures unchanged on the S&P 500. I have to say, if you looked at the equity market yesterday, you would have no idea whatsoever 
what has been happening in this bond market. Your 10-year, 349, <coughs> yields up by three or four basis points. That's like nothing compared to what we've seen recently. The two-year up by 10 or 11 basis points, but still, Lisa, still sub 4% at 399 on a two-year at the moment. This is a fascinating moment, not just for the ECB, but also for Chair Powell next week. The last time we saw this amount of implied volatility in Treasury yields was December 2008. Just to give you a size and scope in terms of what we are talking about in volatility. What we're watching today is Credit Suisse, tick by tick. We are going to just be watching those uh, shares, not just Credit Suisse, but also, Tom, as you mentioned, BNP, SockGen, the European banking complex, which at one point yesterday saw the biggest decline going back to the height of the pandemic in March 2020. How how much do we see a revival in confidence? Because right now, yes, you're seeing a bit of buying, but it is not exactly a ringing endorsement of stability. At 9.15 a.m., what does Christine Lagarde do? Honestly, comes no out with a statement. How do we deal with a situation where there clearly is fragility? at least in sentiment, where they want to give sense that there is a, a, a sense of stability and they are facing an inflation problem. This is just a quagmire to me. Isn't the bank move? Doesn't the bank move tell you? that central bank policy has started to bite. And if it does, is it a mistake to isolate the banking issues from the monetary policy decision? Because the conversation we're ultimately having here is we're asking a question, do they have the tools to insulate certain banks from the rest of the financial system to allow them to carry on hiking? But isn't there a signal coming from the banking system that says, well, the hiking's working. Well, and Tom, to your point, you've been watching the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index religiously, and you have seen an incredible tightening over the yes. past couple of yes. sessions. Well, so to that point that John's <clears throat> making, it's already being reflected in market activity. Let me sell the morning for you. Joining us will be the gentleman of super restrictive, Dominic Constable, join us, a Missy former White. employee of Credit Suisse, and the vice chairman, Richard Clareda, will join us about that partition of monetary policy and bank supervision. Just real quickly... This is a really quite a day to be testifying about President Biden's budget. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is had testifying today before the Senate Finance Committee. It You're had been about the budget. conflating a budget discussion with this well, bank that's crisis. What it was I've never heard of that. Be. How dare you? <laughs> All right, How dare that you? was supposed to be the conversation. <sighs> Instead, it will be about banking stability. Well, should we have a budget special with Janet See? Yellen? What happens with that? You'd like to do a budget special I at 10 a.m. Eastern budget time. budget special with Janet Yellen. Let's try and get through the next couple of Let's hours if we that. can. <laughs> we'll do that with James Athey this morning, investment director at Aberdeen. James, these moves in the bond market, and good morning to you, sir. Your two-year yield over the last few sessions. I'm talking 20 basis points lower Thursday, 28 basis points lower Friday, Monday down 61 basis points, Tuesday up 27, yesterday down 36. What on earth is that? Uh, that's volatility, John. Morning, Good morning. By the way, I was very much enjoying the conversation you guys are having there. Uh, that sounds sounds like the voices inside my head over the last forty eight <laughs> hours, really, just trying to piece it all together. Um, yeah, incredible volatility. I think again, the timing is, is critical here. What we've just seen in terms of banking system in the US, and then subsequently um, fears about banks over here in Europe came hot on the heels of. Uh, the Federal Reserve having opened up the right tail of rates again, you know, the, opening the door to 50 basis point hikes off the basis of, you know, justifiable data, but largely very lagging data, which I think is is my major concern about <laughs> such a move. You, you had that, and within days we had problems in the US banking system. And so we really did aggressively move from one side of the boat to the other. And, and over the last two years, you know, right. what have been the big consensus trades, really, it has been uh, flatteners, it has been shorts, it has been uh, steepness in the strip, all of the things which have been utterly crushed right. in this move. So I think positioning sentiment and market structure, you know, that the role that CTAs we know play in some of these volatile and violent moves, CTAs would have been short at the start right. of this process. And so they will have been covering and probably going long. So I think yeah. it's a confluence of events that gives you that sort of vol. James, I, I know it's inappropriate for you to speak uh, within an executive capability of Aberdeen Asset Management, but I do want to focus on your years of work in asset management where we have seen a crushing battle for profitability. I want you to give us a picture of Credit Suisse with money flowing out. And they've got to make X number of beeps in bond management. They've got to make Y number of beeps in equity management. In the old days, you made 2%. Those days are gone. Can you perceive that any major beleaguered bank can be profitable in asset management given these events? 
Yeah, I mean, this is a long process, Tom, going back 20 years. I started my career at the asset management arm of Deutsche Bank. And, and in the middle 2000s, certainly the London business there was, was deemed really not to be core. It was making a 8 or 9% return on equity at a time where the bank was making 25%. You roll the clock forward five years, and obviously that calculus had completely reversed um, because it turned out those sort of high return on equities for investment banks were utterly unsustainable. We've, we've reached a, a kind of latter phase of this process now because competition and a role of passive investments has really uh, pressured marginal fees lower. And to some degree, the asset management industry is kind of overbroke. You have a huge number of asset managers, and that's, I think, why we've started to see mergers and acquisitions in recent years as people try and find scale just to get that get that profitability. But potentially, the market environment has informed some of that as well. I've long believed that while passive investments absolutely play a role and do offer an attractive uh, you know, option for a lot of investor styles, the idea that you can just passively lock up beta and make money over long periods really is a function of this kind of monetary easing zeitgeist where everything has rallied so long. You go back to periods in history where there have been uh, greater challenges, shall we say, and you get long periods where uh, equity beta, for example, goes nowhere. So I, I do think there is an evolution um, uh, and things will continue to evolve. Um, but you're absolutely right to say that Credit Suisse has had problems from both sides, making money in asset management in a competitive arena, but obviously problems on the investment banking side and the investment banking model as well. And I think that's why their focus is trying to shift back to what they've traditionally been good at, which is very much the wealth management side. Just quickly, uh, shifting back to the profitability of actively managing a, managing a fund right now amid a morass of uncertainty pretty much everywhere, what do you do? I mean, this has been actually probably pretty good for you, James, because you've been uh, conservatively positioned and in safer assets. Do you cash out and go full risk, or do you just hunker down and wait for something to happen? Or. You've probably been speaking to me long enough to know, Lisa, that it takes a little bit more than a, a day's relief to get me fully into risk. <laughs> um, and to actually, I had your voice in my head over the last couple of days thinking about That's you never good describing chance. me as being <laughs> conservatively <laughs> positioned. Um, but yeah, you know, we've been long and in steepness, and so the moves have been largely in the direction that we've been expecting. I, I don't sort of expect... Authorities have taken steps, and they've taken them quickly, and that generally at least it temporarily draws a line under these sorts of events. It does look to me to be largely solvency. This is not credit losses. This is mark-to-market -market losses on very safe assets and drying up of liquidity. So while I still think that there are going to be problems ahead, the moves have been so big, so violent, that yes, we have, we've taken a, you know, a large amount of chips off the table at this point, got much closer to home, um, because ECB meeting, Fed meeting are going to be critical in dictating where we go from here. James Nathy, thank you, sir, of Aberdeen. Thanks, going Jeff. through some of these issues. Thank you very much. What a difficult moment. Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management yesterday. Tip of yeah. the iceberg. Yeah. Tip of the iceberg. Yeah. 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 And he basically put it like this. Look, I'm the CIO, <clears throat> the big asset manager. This is my impression of Bob. I'm not doing a good one. <laughs> I'm not going to do one. He turned around and he said, you look, I'm not going to lend to these companies yeah. anymore. And if I'm not going to do it, if I'm not going to allocate money into risky parts of the market, not many other people are either. Tighter financial conditions are coming, regardless of what these central I banks take, do today yeah, or yeah. next week, for that matter. This is brilliant because I take immense issue with this. The we are the world. We should have all been in this together. And, you know, in Silicon Valley and whatever, we just should have, for the team, done this baloney. Bob Michael is going to manage the bond assets for Mr. Diamond, and that's the only job he has. Well, and yeah, Silicon Valley is going to manage the assets for their portfolio companies and not try to save the bank that basically exactly. fed them for so long. Thank you. By the way, it was a great interview they did with Bob, and what I thought was fascinating okay. was there was a defensiveness. He said, everyone's been saying I'm wrong about being know, defensive know, know, and not yeah. going into high yield bonds. Well, I was right. And I think there is this sort of defensiveness for people who've been calling for some sort of downturn and gotten a lot of heat for it. I noticed that. Do you want the words? that will haunt President Lagarde today and this whole governing council. Here they are. The governing council decided to increase the key interest rate by 25 basis points after raising rates 25 basis points in April 2011 from historically low levels. The further adjustment of the current accommodative monetary policy stance is warranted in the light of upside risk to price stability. Jean-Claude Trichet, July 2011. That's what haunts the CCB. Yes. Coming up, Peter Oppenheimer in the next hour from Goldman. Looking forward to that from New York. This is Bloomberg.
problem is that Credit Suisse, by some standards, might be too big to fail, but also too big to be saved. It's not clear that, unlike the United States, the federal system has enough resources to engineer a bailout. And uh, what they need certainly is more capital, and the question is whether they're going to get that capital or not. Otherwise, bad things can happen. I have to say, Nuria was pretty measured yesterday. Nuria Rabini, Chairman and CEO of the Rabini Macro Associates. Should that worry us Hold a little on. bit more? Measured. He was still talking about how we're facing a stagflationary kind of battle that could potentially percolate into something really negative. Mm. But for Nuria Rabini, that's pretty I mean, Usually I walk away petrified. <laughs> but yesterday I was like, OK. It's, it's, it's an oil I've known for it's forever, and, and I, I really take issue yeah, with this. And you know, Simon Foy's been writing it up wonderfully at the Telegraph. But they, you know, the first thing they lead with is he's Doctor Doom. He's not Doctor Noon. Yeah, I Doom, hate He's that. one of our foremost international economists. And what's important about these guys, and this is Steve Roach, Nora Rabini, uh, Nassim Taleb, and others, John. They live on the balance sheet. Uh, Chris Whalen is a perfect example. These are people that don't look at the income statement. They look at the balance sheet, and like like Bob Michael. They they were way out front on these ratios don't look good. Break of two on Credit Suisse. So we're back to 199. <clears throat> we're positive about 17%. Big move overnight if you are just tuning in. Good morning to you in Europe. You've been following this story all day, I know. Overnight, 145. Zurich time. The statement drops from Credit Suisse. They're tapping the Swiss National Bank for as much as 50 billion Swiss francs and offered to repurchase debt as well. So the stock <clears throat> climbed at the open, has faded since, still positive about 17%. The broader story for Europe, decent gains. The DAX up about four-tenths of 1%. Even the FTSE in London up about a half of 1%. But no real drama here elsewhere. I have to say, futures in the S&P are now negative. They're down about a tenth of 1%. We saw some monster moves in right. the bond market. And <clears throat> yields are up at the front end, Tom, just by about 11 basis points. I say just because we've seen much, much bigger moves than that over the last few days. We're back to about 399, call it 4% on Tuesday this morning. An extended Bloomberg surveillance today on radio and on television. Good morning to all of you. Way too early for all three of us uh, just to be up this hour, but this is important. And it is a Europe opening to a bank crisis, providing leadership for Bloomberg with our terminal top live is John Patrick Barnett, joining us now and Maria Tadeo on the ECB Watch in Frankfurt. You know, Patrick, let me start with you. You were writing up a storm on price move. You were writing up a storm on balance sheet salvation from SMB. You were not writing up a storm on the money flows in and out of this beleaguered bank. Do they need to come out this morning and state the January and the February flows that they observed? Well, that would be very helpful, um, I guess, uh, at least if, if we see some, some positive signs here. So what we got right now is I would say some painkillers um, for, for for Credit Suisse, which is which is good. And I, I have to say, I'm positively surprised that the regulator was so fast to uh, to act here. And um, I mean, like on the other hand, I'm not sure if this is a good sign or a, or a bad sign. Um, but still, it's a painkiller. It's not curing um, what is what is hurting Credit Suisse, and that is a profit profitability issue and like a, a, a very grim outlook for the earnings going forward. Uh, I still think the bank has uh, probably struggled to to improve that. And when you're talking to analysts and and investors managers on on the stock they still say like okay this is giving them some time uh, we've taken off the pressure for the moment uh, but the story is not over yet and the question now is like what do we do with Credit Suisse going forward? Which is a reason why a J.P. Morgan analyst came out this morning and said a takeover is the most likely scenario, some sort of combination, possibly a forced marriage with rival UBS. How much is that in the ether this morning, some sort of forced merger, forced sale that happens sooner rather than later? Well, I would say it's uh, the most likely scenario, as uh, as JP Morgan has pointed out, because all the other scenarios are um, highly unlikely to happen. The one would be like to give Credit Suisse just like more time on its own to solve uh, solve the problem. It's clearly not an option, even like before the events of last week, that was a, a, a difficult thing uh, with the three-year plan as the market is becoming very impatient. The other one would be like eject more uh, equity into the bank. At this point, I would say also at least very difficult to pull this off. So all you're left over is like some kind of a merger. The question here now I would ask is like, can you merge the bank as a whole or do you need to split it up bef uh, before? I would say it's probably the latter. And then you do something like that. You merge the domestic Swiss business with UBS and you sell off the investment bank to some other bidders or something like that. Uh, it's going to be messy. There's lots of details and uncertainties in there. Um, but if I have to make a bet, I would say that it's probably something that we uh, really could see like coming up in the next couple of weeks and months.
Maria Tadeo, Christine Lagarde wanted to stay in bed today. She did not want to come out and address everybody and try to figure out how to thread this needle. What on earth does she do? Uh, well, look, I think what she's thinking is, uh, timing. Well, what a timing to have to be uh, making this decision uh, today. And uh, we agree that just a week ago, and this just shows just how fast uh, things have moved. This was a central bank that was an autopilot. It was 50 basis points, very well calibrated, core inflation, sticky. And the message from the European Central Bank is we got to take decisive action. Obviously, we see this banking chaos uh, going on, the fears around credit streets uh, yesterday, and that flipped sentiment to one key line that she said a month ago, not in the statement, but in the press conference, 50 basis points was a strong determination unless something, quote, extreme happened. That prompted a debate about whether or not Credit Suisse could be that extreme factor that could lead to a reversal to 25 basis points. <clears throat> now, this morning, once again, the narrative changes. You see that the stock 600 for banks is positive, and a lot of the ECB watchers that I speak to today are now telling me that any and this proves right. the European Central Bank, single mandate central bank, they got to look past the volatility, stay with the data, and hike right. 50 basis points. But that is the tug of war today for Madame Lagarde. Maria, two threads, and you can answer it any way you'd like in this moment. One is Macron's on the phone looking at BNP Paribas imploding, saying, let's go, let's go. And the other is a position of Jakob Nagel at the Bundesbank. What will Macron and Nagel do today? Well, and remember, I spoke with the head of the German Central Bank a week ago who told me decisively the European Central Bank had to take action or would have uh, to, to take action because core inflation was just absolutely not acceptable at the rate that it is, around 5%. Now, Emmanuel Macron today, by the way, is not focused so much on this because he's got a pension reform he's got to focus on. But what we do know is that the French finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, was on the phone with his Swiss counterpart because of the moves that we saw. <coughs> in the French banking system uh, yesterday. I think uh, today, again, uh, more than Macron or uh, the German Central Bank, it really comes down to Christine Lagarde. This is her job. This is what she needs to do to come out with a strong message in this press conference, which will be dominated by this banking question, and really instill confidence in the system. Can she do that? I mean, we're going to have to wait and see. Hey, Maria, thank you. Alongside Jan Patrick, to the both of you, thanks very much. The Bloomberg coverage on both Credit Suisse and on the ECB as well. Whatever Christine Lagarde does today should be criticised for it because there is no good decision on a day like today whatsoever. And even harder, this meeting, Tom, just like the Fed next week, they have to provide some forecasts. Try putting out some forecasts. I mean, I want to well, share pound next week. If I was him, I'd hold back the SCP. I'd deliver them in the news conference. I would this, say, look, these are what we've, this is what we've done, but I want to be very, very careful here. We have absolutely no clue, no idea. This is a really important insight in that does this crisis have a more holistic, larger view where you get into disinflation and deflationary dampening influences, particularly on real GDP? Witness uh, oil. I mean, to see Brent, we're not to 69 on Brent. 74.11 is shocking. But the idea that people are going to start marking down their GDP calls like OEC did yesterday, I think, is unspoken here. It's too early to know. It's too early to know, and quite clearly for European banks this morning, it's too early to know too. So yes, you've got this big move in Credit Suisse after a monster move from the bank overnight to tap liquidity from the SMB. But let's take SockGen. You mentioned SockGen, right? We were down yesterday 12%. We're up this morning half of 1%. Does that sound like a relief oh, to you? God, you, you? John, you put me in the most uncomfortable situation. You let brought me, up let the me bank. Put it, you invoked the name. It's my fault. Um, it, it, let me put it this way, folks. Each of these banks have a character and a history. And BNP Paribas, the giant retail conservative juggernaut of Paris, is not the math whizzes and derivative jockeys over at Sakchen. That's a stereotype. BNP yesterday came out and said they were going to reduce their counterparty risk through the derivatives market with Credit Suisse. These are ways to try to shore up this reputation. It's basically a way of saying, look, we're not at risk too. And as far as we know, US banks have been doing that for a while as right. well. So some of this just really isn't new. Equity futures negative, Credit Suisse higher by 20% this morning. Still trying to work out what I'm doing here.
Maybe you at home are trying to work out the same thing. Tom, I used to do good this morning. five days a week. Bravo, good With morning. Thank you. Good morning to you too. It's coming at 5 a.m. Uh, it's used not, to love it's, that, didn't it's you? It's massively <laughs> nonlinear. If you get 15 minutes more sleep through the morning, mm, yeah. it's like exponential. It's a fancy You were sleeping during the show. Function. I used to nod off, yeah. yeah I, I, I'm aware. I have honestly done that, folks. <laughs> I have fallen asleep on air twice. Few. Literally falling asleep. Would you like to air. share who the guest was at the time? I, I think it was Freddie Late. It was, I think it was Freddie Late. Freddie, please don't Latitude. go. Let's go to the price action briefly. Okay, let's reset. Thank you. Yeah. Equity futures down about a tenth. I want to look at Credit Suisse first. It's up 19%. Big move lower in yesterday's session. But this time yesterday, we were looking potentially to drop below two and thought that was dramatic. And right now we're back to around two. Two Swiss francs on the stock. So, yes, elevated off the back of the drama through the whole of yesterday. A statement late last night from the bank that Credit Suisse has tapped the Swiss National Bank for as much as 50 billion francs. They're offering to repurchase debt as well. Their top shareholder told Bloomberg yesterday when asked if they'd provide more assistance. Absolutely not. They talked about the regulatory reasons, but they also said there were other reasons as well. That same individual spoke to CNBC this morning and basically said everything's fine. It's panic, a little bit of panic that I believe is completely unwarranted. So do whatever you want with that. I thought it was bizarre yesterday and maybe today's a bit of a cleanup act. So that's the stock that everyone's watching right now. Futures down a tenth of 1%. That's not a major bounce, though I have to say the move in equities yesterday with the Nasdaq oh. positive again, you'd never know what was happening elsewhere based on the index level story, Tom in America yesterday. Yeah, and the futures just in the last 25 minutes have come back. We had green on the screen, and we don't have green on the screen anymore. Can we all agree the EU bounce this morning is maybe a little tough? It's pretty tame. It's pretty tame okay. stuff. You look to Germany, up a half of 1%. Can I do a penny stock? We don't usually do this. It's a, on the pink just, sheet? Just I one, thought that was just credit stock. Stock. The two-year treasury? The two-year treasury. <laughs> Bramma knows where I'm going. <laughs> this is ridiculous. This is a two-year treasury bond. And look at what it's doing. Up another 13 basis points, 4.02%. And I went through the moves we've had over the last few days. 20 basis points Thursday, 28 basis points Friday, 61 basis points <coughs> on Monday. Tuesday up 27, down 36 Wednesday. I mean, what, what's going on, Bramo? Well, part of this, people are saying, possibly is a liquidity issue. I mean, we're seeing volatility that we have not seen since 2008. But I do wonder whether this is basically a commentary on a lack of credibility and a lack of authority from central banking uh, units. We don't have a sense of how they will respond to this. We don't have a sense of any consistency in messaging. We haven't gotten any. And I understand that the data has been very confusing. I understand that the actual macroeconomic picture has been very confusing. But there really hasn't been a steady guide in terms tone or approach for a number of months now, at least from the US. This has been, and I said this earlier in the week, the biggest reappraisal of monetary policy worldwide in the smallest window, perhaps, ever. I, only I the other week, ever is only the other week, yeah. the Austrian Central Bank governor was talking about <clears throat> going 50, 50, 50, 50 at the ECB, and now we're asking the question as to whether they hike at all today. We were talking about possibly a terminal rate that should have been more in the 6 or 7% level. People talking about how since nothing well, was breaking, there is a resilience in a market that <clears throat> suggests something that is a new regime. This, Suddenly we're talking about going back to zero. I, and I want to get to our guests, but you're, you're dead on, but there's twofold here. One is the level and move, and there are a lot of people calling for higher rates. Higher rates didn't ruin this economy. What ruined it was the first derivative, the rate of change. Boy, we got there quickly. And in hindsight, maybe we got there too quickly. Nevertheless, you got to get out to that rate after the Biden stimulus. Jay Barry, JP Morgan and the Investment Bank, <clears throat> last 24 hours, looking the gains in the bond market. He believes Lisa Hikes are coming. That's a different view on this bond market right now. Yes. Not everyone has capitulated to this idea that they're done. <clears throat> I know the market is screaming they're done. Right. I know there are several banks saying that the Fed's going to pause next week. Wells, Goldman, <coughs> Barclays. But you've still got B of A, Morgan Stanley, City, saying we get hike next week. I would say I spent a lot of time thinking about this question. What's worse for the market if they do hike or if they don't hike? You asked this yesterday. You asked this the day before. Right now, if they don't hike, 
Does that mean that they see deeper financial I, distress I coming from banks I that are otherwise saying this is not an issue with liquidity, I, this is an issue of confidence in the market? We've got to get to Mr. Lay, but I, I don't agree with that at all. This is a central bank apparatus that has to look at banking integrity. Monetary policy right now, frankly, doesn't matter, and Lagarde's okay, going to say that but today. But right now, they've put the backstops <clears throat> in. They say that the banking system has integrity. So if they're saying that, oh. then if they don't raise rates because they're concerned about banking integrity, well, that sends a message. That's my point. But anyway, you know when a baby on. falls over, and if you make a big deal of it, it starts to cry. But 100%. if you don't, yes. it's at that kind of moment. Are we treating <clears throat> trillion dollars of, of securities like, like toddlers? Wait till my kids grow up before you I, The thing that I always skills. hate for central banks, this is <laughs> the number one thing. Do you ever notice how the one without children is telling you about <laughs> children? The number one. He's correct. I know this but, from my you know. nephew and, and my younger sister oh, when I was a child okay. time, of course. Very good. Thank you. Did you make a big deal of it? I'm guessing not. I just wanted to make for a sure. point, if I can. <laughs> And now I've totally lost my train of thought because you guys keep winding me up about all of this. For central banks right now, this is just tremendously difficult. For Lagarde yes. a little bit later, I don't know what they do. I imagine they are worried about the psychological question you raise. I think it's a really, really important question as well. The issue I have at the moment, I think we started this debate last week and said, do they have the tools to address what's happening in the banking sector to allow them to carry on attacking inflation <clears throat> with monetary policy? I think the bigger question is, is it a mistake to isolate what's happening in the banking system to make a monetary policy decision, because aren't the two connected somehow? We've been talking about this now for They're 12 connected. months. At some They're point, connected. something breaks. Yes. And when that thing breaks, or at least begins to crack, a lot of people are going to tighten up lending. Now, you'd imagine, regardless of what happens with the Fed next week or the ECB today, that if you are a bond investor, a bank, to some extent, you are tightening your lending conditions, right? You're tightening your standards. And, Tom, if that's going to happen, if that's going to develop, then we should see well, the central bank have their job done for them. And we're going to find where the zombies are of all different characters. And clearly in the zeitgeist, Credit Suisse is not the same as Silicon Valley Bank. That's one no, of the absolutely great not. ideas that we've seen. Let's get to our guest right now. We wanted to find somebody more miserable about his nation than this financial crisis. Freddie Lake did rugby at his Oxford as he studied mathematics and is mortified by the collapse in Six Nation rugby of England. Mr. Late, we won't talk about rugby this morning. There's other matters. But let's talk about about the Six Nations battle of EU banking. Are they all on the same page, or is it every nation, every central bank for themselves? Morning. Um, I think I think there's a big difference. I think what we're seeing at the moment, um, you know, you just alluded to it in your conversation, is, is creative destruction, which is always a good thing. You know, we've all known for the last six, 12 months, we're going to need to see clearing events in different sectors, and banking's <laughs> often the first. Uh, and so creative destruction is always good in, over the long term, but it's always painful when we experience it. And, I, I, you know, I don't know where this will spread, but I think, you know, the central banks have very, very moved very quickly with very strong right. tools to try to contain these individual situations. So I think the contagion is limited, but the same impulse could cause more effects at other banks. If we all go Joseph Schumpeter and enjoy, and enjoy a global creative destruction, is it a banking roll up that makes the strong banks stronger? Well, someone said the other day on um, uh, one of the shows, you know, there's two ways you can do it. You can either not let uh, banks take over the deposits or you can let them take them over. And either way, the deposits trend towards the bigger banks. And so, you know, this will be whether it's whether it's takeovers or whether it's actual business just moving into the bigger and stronger balance sheets. It's going to accelerate over the over the coming days and months and years, I, I anticipate. Freddie, can you do anything in this environment in terms of investing? <laughs> I hope so. Um, it is my job. Um, look, it's hard. I think the, the, the reason why we're seeing things like the two years jumping around as much as been pointed out and stocks and, and markets in general is because we are going through a change of regime and it's taking time and it will take time, years, before people get hold of what the next reg regime looks like. You know, we expect a lot more volatility and we expect sort of sideways moves in markets. But that doesn't mean there's not something to do, especially within the equity market. Um, you know, even within banking, I think something like JP Morgan or Bank of America or Goldman Sachs, perhaps, are, are already looking interesting at this point on a multi-year view. But outside of banking, and there is a huge amount of uh, other stocks to look at, there's plenty of businesses that can grow through the environment as we see it and come out stronger. So I think there's a lot to be done. I think it's actually quite an opportunity rich environment. Um, but you've got to understand the regime's completely changed. We're not going back to the kind of buy the dip, Fed bails you out on monetary policy. 
they're bailing you out or helping by containing systemic issues in banks, but monetary policy is quite independent, the linkage obviously being financial conditions. We've been talking about regime shift for a while, Freddie, and the funny thing about it is that people have come up with a different regime every five minutes that we're heading into. It's very difficult to get a handle on what that looks like. And in the meantime, people are going back to the tried and true. Yesterday, when you saw bonds rally so significantly, you saw tech outperform in the U.S. At what point will we understand what this new narrative is, especially if we do get some sort of recession, we do get some sort of crisis that leads to lower inflation than people previously thought? I think it will take a few years. I mean, I think even when you think back to the most recent one, the financial crisis, it was really, you know, we, it, by 2011-12, we were still going through European banking crises, sort of Greece potentially going bust. And then we had the TLTRO and the draggy moment in 2012. And at that point, you kind of got the measure of it. The central banks are here to support and inflate the asset side of the balance sheet of the economy. And that was the sort of trigger, really. It was three years later till you had clarity. And even then, if you'd spotted it in 2012, you were quite early. Most people got it in 13, 14. So that's five years later. Right. And so I think that's what we're in for. I think these regimes take a long time to reassert themselves. And in the interim, we have volatility and no real direction for markets. Freddie, let's pretend there's no crisis. What's your sector overweight this morning? Um, well, we, we actually are rather dull. We rather run a <clears throat> sort of balanced book. But um, I think there is a reason why certain defensive sectors have been doing well. But I think... Irrespective of the, the crisis we're seeing at the moment, one of the themes that seems really likely to play out over the next five to 10 years to us is the CapEx replacement cycle, reinvestment cycle, reshoring, and everything that supports that. So I think plays on that, which might be capital goods companies, I think to a degree energy companies uh, or other industrial exposed companies. While right now, obviously, we are risking running into a recession, most of the businesses are priced for that. And on a multi-year view, I think that's a decent overweight. Hi, Freddie. Thank you. Freddie Light there on the latest in this market. Can I just share this with you? Based on our survey for the ECB today, every single economist is looking for 50 basis points with the exception <coughs> of one. Deutsche Bank, they're looking for 25. Now, some of these forecasts are a little bit dated. They're from March 9th, March 9th, etc. But Tom, that just gives you a, the tone, the flavor of things going into this ECB. I think, you know, uncertainty, this is, you know, my favorite book. We've all, I've bored everybody with it. Um, uh, Peter Bernstein, Against the Gods. And there's risk. And then there's this strange thing, uncertainty. John, uncertainty is not risk and uncertainty is not fear. Uncertainty is I can't figure out what to do with my math to make a guess. And right now, I'm not sure there's much math going on here. It's mostly, as Freddie brilliantly said, we have to clear markets. So there's two things, Tom. One, the decision today, and next, the uncertainty around the next decision. So we thought they'd pre-commit to 50 today and maybe do it again for the next meeting. So the option that's available to them is just to say, truly, and I think they can say this now, because they've got to say this, truly, there is no forward guidance. This is meeting by meeting. We'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and Lisa's idea here of... You know, delay or whatever is 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 actually in play. And uh, Jermaine, what I'm stunned by, and I think it's cultural, is in 2008, people were out front and visible. The Secretary of Treasury was visible every day. Mr. Diamond was visible. Is he considered Bear Stearns, et cetera, et cetera? CS with Francine Lacroix the other day was basically invisible, and they've been invisible for the last three days. Get out there in front of the mic and say something, but that's not the Swiss way. What would you like them to say? What do you think would I would get like it done? them, as I said to John Patrick Barnett, the heart of the matter is flows to their flagship wealth management. They have to clarify flows, good or bad. My problem is that right now they can't really clarify with any story that's going to really <laughs> shore up morale and give a sense forward because right now they're facing a lot of uncertainty. This is a tricky moment, and I, that's the reason why it's so hard to give clarity. There is none. And so what do you I don't, do as a policy I don't a think there's maker? a difference between two Swiss francs and 0.5. What's a, what's a hundredth of a Swiss franc? I don't know, a centime? Centime, a centime. Centime, centime. 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 Like yeah. yeah, great. I think yeah, we need you know. a road trip I mean, to check I, it out. I, when I'm at the McDonald's. See how our trips went over there. Just right? down from Credit Suisse is a McDonald's. A number two mm. value meal is, that's is not $14. Where you and I went. That's, that's really it's not where you and I just throw them 20, 20 euros and put them on. Oh, you get the euros. Yeah, I, right. I do that. <laughs> I, I just do that. They convert them. Okay. The futures right now, yeah. down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. for a number two value. Credit Suisse, two-handle, just about holding on. It's positive on the session over in Switzerland, up by almost 22%. In the next hour, 
Ian Linnan of BMO Capital Markets. Looking forward to that conversation a little bit later. From New York City this morning, good morning. ECB has to acknowledge that they've got to ring fence things and make sure that they put enough firewalls in place actually to help CS, let CS get time, but more importantly, to ensure that there's no chance of this attracting the attention of other banks. Peter Chair there of Academy Securities on the latest with the banking situation. Here's the latest right now over in Switzerland. The stock is higher by a little more than 20% on Credit Suisse. The news last night, overnight, a statement at 1.45 a.m. <coughs> Zurich time that Credit Suisse was ultimately tapping the Swiss National Bank for 50 billion Swiss francs, offering to repurchase some debt as well. Is that enough? Is that enough? We're looking at European equities right now. Getting deeper into the session, equities over in Europe, positive. The FTSE up three quarters of 1%, the DAX up four tenths on the periphery, we're doing OK. Futures here in the United States, as we just wake up and gauge things, we're down about a tenth, two tenths of 1%. Going into the ECB a little bit later, <coughs> this morning with euro dollar looking like this 106 up a third of one percent and president Lagarde firmly between a rock and a hard place we've all had these conversations with investors about what they like they say we're defensive okay tell me what defensive is and they say we're like high quality assets and fixed income i'm like tell me more yeah. and they're like investment grade credit and my response is wasn't svb investment grade like a week ago yeah. you know I mean, like don't don't we have to rethink some of this stuff lisa first republic which was just downgraded to junk. I mean, how do we look at all of these safe assets, especially when you have volatility in the safest of safe that is akin to what we saw in 2008? And this time is before we get to the risky stuff. I, 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 I'm I, looking at this as in equities and bonds, as Freddie uh, said earlier, we're going to clear the markets, and we're doing that at right now. And in Credit Suisse, we're clearing this morning. And, you know, stability at two Swiss francs, John? But as we go through the morning, and we have to hear from them. That's, as I said Well, just earlier. to give you a flavor of high-yield spreads, Tom, they were <clears> 390 <throat> last Tuesday, and right now they're 511. So that's yeah. some real spread widening, Lisa, that's come through this market in about a week. And Matt Mish uh, put out a note of UBS and basically said, what are we pricing in with credit spreads where they are? And still, he says, they're not pricing in right. the kind of distress that you could see if there truly is. And this is really the key question, and you guys both have been talking about this, Tom, is if you do get a pullback of banks lending, a real profound fundamental tightening in credit <clears throat> conditions. We're going to drive forward here on this special coverage that we have this morning on radio and TV around the world. And we're thrilled to bring you a gentleman with big bank experience and strategy at J.P. Morgan and now at Tricomen, uh, a managing partner. Seb Walker joins us uh, this morning. Seb, you know Canary what? Wharf really, really well. You know the distance from, say, one Cabot Square to 25 Cabot Square, Credit Suisse to Morgan Stanley, great. Credit Suisse has to get along with its brethren. That's the wheelhouse of what you do at Tricumen. How does Credit Suisse speak to other major banks this morning? So I think where we are now is probably a culmination of a long story of a, a lack of clear business strategy by the bank. Uh, so if we step back, you know, post the financial crisis, Credit Suisse was uh, trying to restructure itself. It's gone through a number of changes. Uh, we've seen management reporting and uh, reporting out to investors change numerous times. We've seen lots of restructuring, but nothing that's had a clarity of the kind of restructuring we saw at UBS. <clears throat> and as a result, we have UBS now in a very solid position. We see their deposits have hardly changed uh, in recent times, whereas Credit Suisse is uh, suffering from this lack of clarity and essentially having the wrong business mix in its investment bank in order to match up right. its wealth business. One of the great themes I've seen in 10 years is the discussion of within country mergers, UBS Credit Suisse is one thought, or cross-border banking mergers. They're really hard to do, aren't they, in Europe? Are we anywhere near somebody could come in from other EU nations, including the United Kingdom, or dare I say from America, to take out parts of Credit Suisse? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, certainly, if you look at the European banking sector overall, uh, we, as a firm, see very few strong players. Uh, we think Barclays is in a very strong position. It has a clear strategy with its transatlantic focus. 
but it's not really in a position to make big acquisitions at the moment. Uh, some of the French banks, BNP Paribas, seems to be pretty strong. But again, I wouldn't see them reaching out to make a big acquisition uh, anytime soon. And as for the rest, you know, I, I just don't see they've got the kind of firepower right now. It's very much been in recent times a story of U.S. banks uh, taking advantage of the stronger U.S. market while Europe has been generally weaker. Seb, when you talk about BNP, we talk about the contagion not necessarily with respect to any fundamentals, but with share price, with sentiment that we see in investors. How do you parse the sentiment as expressed in what we saw yesterday from the reality, from the fundamentals of banking, which are tied to sentiment so intimately? Yeah. So I think there are three things going on. Firstly, um, there's an element out there that is <clears throat> taking bits of data and extrapolating too far. You know, if you look out at some of the retail investors, We've got people suddenly scurrying around trying to understand what unrealized uh, losses are, for example. So that's one dynamic. The other one is just a straight sector fear, I think, and, uh, and a general feeling of, OK, this is a sector we perhaps aren't comfortable with. Um, and the third, I think, though, as I said, is, is really a lack of understanding of getting under the hood of what the business model of all these banks are. If we go back to the financial crisis and look at Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, when you pull apart their business model, a significant portion, and I forget the exact numbers, but over 50 percent was essentially a bet on the MBS business, uh, which in itself at that time was a bet on the U.S. housing market. So when you, you start to pair back what the business model is, I think we can get a much better understanding of the real risks <laughs> and opportunities of any given bank. Seb, as you parse through everything that we're talking about and the uncertainty, when do you get the confidence that we've seen a bottoming out, that there's an opportunity, mm. not just in the biggest and the best, but also in some of the most beaten up? Yeah. So I think this is, needs two strands. The first one is the regulators. Um, it's helpful what the, the Swiss are doing right now to try and step in and provide some comfort, but I think they could be more aggressive with that. Um, the lesson, I think, of the financial crisis is bold moves by regulators early on help quell the situation. The other thing that was mentioned earlier on is transparency. Um, so, you know, if we look at the last reporting, um, someone like CS, so they've lost, I think, 43% of their deposits. Half of those are from foreign investors. Um, the Swiss deposit base has been more resilient, but we don't know where that is now. And I think having a better understanding, having the management come out and state uh, what the situation is, what their plans are, I think would certainly help calm things. Hey, Seb, thanks for your perspective, your insight. Cool, calm heads prevail on mornings <coughs> like these, Tom, that's for sure. Seb Walker of Trikim and Managing Partner. I was asked last night, and I'm sure you were as well, by many different people, are we on the precipice, the edge, the brink of a financial crisis? And my answer is just, I've got no idea. I've got to work through some stuff. I said this, though. If these issues came about pre-crisis, without a doubt, we'd be going into a crisis because they didn't have the tools, the whereabouts, the understanding of how quickly they needed to respond. All of the things that Seb was just discussing there, think about what we did on Sunday evening. Would that have happened back in 07, 08, or would they have dragged their feet around some of these issues? They understood exactly what Seb just said, that the faster and the more you come out with something significant, the more you're going to stave off some of the contagion. And that's why I think we're all asking, is it enough if it hasn't yet fully stabilized the situation? And is more needed, well, to your point, Tom, about leaders coming out? I, I, again, I'm going to look at the magnitude that we've seen in lift in rates. I'm not going to go into the math, but I did a fancy log study of the Fed's, the U.S. central bank rate. And the answer, as John mentioned earlier, is never before is where we are. And the quickest way to solve the slope of that move up and its agony and get to where Dudley and Elarian, as one, two names have mentioned, is to pause and bring the slope out as you pause. There's a certain comfort to pause right now. Talk about data dependent. Maybe they're news dependent as well. Maybe that's a new phrase. It's just in terms of standing up and being transparent, <clears throat> I think you're right, of course, but ultimately, these guys would be criticised whatever they did. 100%. If they're on TV every single day, we'd be criticising for that too. And if they said, we're getting complete outflows and all of our, our uh, know, Swiss tick, uh, tick clients are leaving, I think the people would That's, be like, really? This isn't helping. It's not going to help anyone. So if we did that hour, do we get to go home an hour We do. Early? We won't be here next. Up next, okay. Matt Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Matt. Stay in bed. The problem is that Credit Suisse, by some standards, might be too big to fail, but also too big to be saved. This stock has been 
in a huge downfall for two years. So there are clearly problems within this particular institution. We simply don't know the degree to which this is systemic or isolated. As a global bank, there might be counterparty risks for some of the U.S. banks. If one gets into trouble, people very quickly start looking, oh, what's the next one that looks remotely like this? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. We've got a long day ahead of us, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Equity futures right now, negative a tenth of 1%. Credit Suisse is flying. Here's your bounce, up 21%. Here's the story, though, still in and around. Two Swiss francs a share. Tom, overnight, late last night in Zurich, 1.45 a.m. 1.45 a.m., the yeah, statement drops. That's exactly. happened in the S&B for 50 billion Swiss. Well, it shows the urgency of where we are right now. We've had a bounce. I don't think the bounce is as important as off the opening bid this morning, John. We were down 16, 17% here, nicely above two Swiss francs. We've just got a little bit of a bid here uh, in the last hour. And you say to yourself, okay, what's next? They're going to mop up the bonds from that transaction. But what's next is this bank has to provide clarity on their core profit machine, which is wealth management. They have not done that. So let's talk options. The team here at Bloomberg reported <sighs> yesterday the Swiss authorities and Credit Suisse were discussing ways to stabilise the bank. One option was a public statement. We got one yesterday afternoon. Then we got the follow-through overnight. Other options, Elisa, let's talk about those other options. Separation of the Swiss unit, tie-up with UBS... These are conversations. And you said it earlier on this morning. <clears throat> We've got no idea what the conversations are behind closed doors. No idea whatsoever. Which is the reason why Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank put out a note this morning where he basically said yesterday was uh, a day you could look at the screens and really wonder what as a research analyst you can really say that helps anyone. The situation is fairly binary and you are not privy to any of the conversations behind the scenes. That is where we all are as they try to come up with well, some solution that may on. be very market moving and we just don't know. You know we give out an award every month here folks the gnomes of surveillance for our person in the control room with the least communication skills and and, uh, you know, it's like the gnomes of Zurich. It's about silence. It's about quiet. I mean, the heritage that they're dealing with is a heritage of secrecy. It's not a cliche. They're not used to the vibrancy and visibility of Silicon Valley Bank over the weekend. Hasn't that been blown up over the last 10 years in that country? I don't think so. This think is that a culture really is really sticky? I think it's changed. That's what my reporting is. It's amended. Davide Serra is brilliant at this, uh, the great bank analyst. But, you know, I, I, I would say, and I think Davide would say, a lot of it's still cultural. I take your point, and I'll take it a step further. Perhaps this is one reason why it makes it very difficult for there to be a cross-border merger, because the culture is distinct, <clears throat> and the culture of banking in Switzerland is distinct. And so if you have a U.S. bank coming in or some other bank with a very different culture, it becomes difficult, which raises a question of who would be the tie-up with if it's UBS? How do you insulate something so that it doesn't create a liability for someone that has otherwise shore themselves up? ECB, up next. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. oh, yeah. Over to you, Christine wow. Lagarde. Over to you. 50, 25 <clears throat> or nothing at all. I mean, there's some people out there talking about cuts. I'm looking at you, Namora, and the Federal Reserve <laughs> next week. Unreal. <laughs> Futures right now. Let's whip through it on the S&P 500. Negative a tenth of 1%. Just a little bit softer here. Over in Europe, a lift to the equity market. Let's pick out the DAX, for example, up a half of 1%. In Spain and Italy, up seven tenths up 1%, respectively. Looking at the bond market, yields higher. Three basis points, so. 3.4 885 on a 10 year, the two year trading like a penny stock for the last week or so, just south of four, three. 99. Lisa, the two-year up 11 basis points this morning in the U.S. It's unreal. The volatility that we have not seen in the benchmark rates of the world, frankly, unlike what we've seen since 2008. What we are watching today literally is Credit, Credit Suisse shares and shares of all European banks. Are we there yet? Have we stabilized? If you take a look at the uh, stocks bank index, you are seeing a bit of a bounce, but not enough to give us that sense. And that really uh, has been the question. Then at 9.15, over to you, Christine Lagarde. What do you do? The ECB rate decision followed by her press conference at 9.45 a.m. Eastern time. Does she punt 
does she say we're going to reconvene in a week and tell you what we're going to do because they're kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't between a rock and a hard place and this market cannot figure out what they are going to do other than bring down the rate hiking expectations and then at 10 a.m. more potential guidance from U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen she's testifying before the Senate Finance Committee ostensibly this was to be uh, was supposed to be about President Biden's uh, plan for the budget it will not it will be about uh, Silicon Valley Bank it'll be about the small and medium sized banking system more broadly. It'll be about the interconnectedness of U.S. and European banks at a time when still this central bank is hoping to raise rates to curtail inflation, John. Lisa, thanks for that. Let's get straight to the guest, Peter Oppenheimer, Chief Global Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Peter, great to catch up with you, sir. Really difficult moment, so thanks for carving out some time you. in your schedule. Thank you. You did like European banks. The facts have changed in the last week. Do you still like them? We do. <clears throat> Uh, clearly, in a situation like this, there's massive uncertainty, and I think the volatility that you've been speaking about and Lisa discussed is going to continue. But I do think it's important to, to, to recognise the underlying fundamentals here are pretty good. You've got strong <coughs> capital buffers, tier, uh, core tier one capital of around 15%, compared to about 5% for the European banks during the crisis in, uh, in 2008. You've got stable funding dynamics, 1.8 trillion of excess uh, uh, deposits and you've got very ample liquidity. And the liquidity coverage ratio is around 150% uh, at the end of last year. So it's a very different fundamental situation. And indeed, rising interest rates, which we've been seeing, is actually very good for the banks. Um, but, you know, confidence mm -hmm. is everything. And while this uncertainty continues, uh, they're likely to remain volatile, but they are cheap and I think they're fundamentally in a relatively strong place. Peter, we note your decades of experience in seeing multiple crises. I know you've been to Zurich any number of times and know that what matters is to take lunch at the Kronenhall, Das Restaurant Kronenhall. That's what everybody <laughs> does in Zurich. It's the only place to eat. I get it. But when you're eating there now in this crisis at Kronenhall, is Switzerland part of Europe? Or is Switzerland still separate from Europe amid this crisis? Well, I don't think in a, in a banking crisis that anything is really separate, uh, and particularly in a banking situation where you've got cross-border uh, integration and connectivity. So other central banks around the world will be talking to the Swiss authorities, and I think will be also uh, preparing statements or willing to provide uh, as much liquidity uh, that's required if the situation continues to, to uh, unwind. Obviously, there's a difficult decision that the ECB have got to make, as Lisa was saying earlier. Um, but I think, again, they will emphasise the robustness of the underlying uh, system and their readiness to provide liquidity using some of the existing tools that they already have, potentially providing more. Um, but I think they'll take some comfort from the underlying uh, balance sheet strength of the banking sector in Europe, which, of course, we couldn't have said a decade ago. So I think from that perspective, it's a much more uh, robust uh, underlying situation. Peter, will you still be bullish on European banks if the ECB does not, cut, uh, does not hike rates today and indicates that they're on pause until they have more clarity? I think that it's very unlikely they'll say they're on pause because that will if anything, provide some sort of sense that they're concerned about the contagion effects of this. I think they've got to look at the underlying fundamentals of the economy. Actually, that's looking pretty good. We don't expect a recession this year in Europe. Uh, inflation, core inflation, uh, underlying inflation is above their target rate. They've signalled quite strongly that they expect to raise the rates by 50 basis points. And the banking system, again, as I would say, appears uh, fundamentally resilient. And so I think they would want to sort of stay the course, but at the same time provide statements that are reassuring about their willingness to provide liquidity, uh, to emphasise existing tools that are in place and that have been built up over the last few years since the uh, sovereign debt crisis and their ability to look at other things as well if, 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 if it's required. And Peter, do you think that tighter financial conditions, tighter lending standards are just inevitable now after what we've seen in the last week? I, yes, I do. Um, and I think this is all really a function of a massive shift in the cost of capital that we've been seeing over the last year, year and a half. I mean, you, know, you only have to go back a year and a half and 
about a quarter of all government debt around the world had a negative yield. You know, people were paying for the privilege of lending money to governments. That world has changed. You're getting close to 5% uh, on US dollar cash with zero uh, volatility and risk. And that's a high hurdle for <coughs> asset markets to pass. But it also means that there is a tightening in financial conditions and a rise in the cost of capital, which is inevitably having an impact on pushing valuations of assets down. And it's clearly causing some friction in areas of the financial markets. But if the underlying situation is uh, uh, robust and the capital buffers are in place, it won't prevent these problems, but may restrict the uh, contagion and the systemic uh, fallout from them. And that's, that's I think, uh, you know, fundamentally the important point to take away from this. A delicate moment. Peter, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Peter, thank you. Peter Oppenheimer there of Goldman Sachs. I think we're all bracing for this now. Just GDP cut after GDP cut after GDP That's cut. That's where I am. Because of what Peter just described at yeah. the end there. Yeah, that, the, the outcome of this, and there's been a number of notes in this. Doug Cass, is, who's a, let me remind everyone, Doug Cass was a world-class bank analyst a few years ago. Small startup firm, Kidder Peabody, back uh, this is five, ten years ago. And Doug said, he went right to that. He said the outcome of every crisis is dampen consumption, dampen investment. Well, and Goldman Sachs, so his peer, <laughs> uh, Peter's peer, Jan Hatzias, put out a say? note basically raising their recession forecasts based on exactly that tighter uh, financial conditions, all the way to 35 percent in the U.S., which <laughs> is still you, really below. Goldman Sachs. Yeah, <laughs> which is still below the 60 percent median right. of economist survey by Bloomberg. We're struggling to be light here in the midst of this huge crisis. And I mentioned the Cronin Hall there, which is one of the most magnificent low-key restaurants I've ever been in, John. So I'm there one night in Zurich, and you know how expensive it is. I mean, you and I have... have We've uh, been there, yeah. So I go in... And, the, you know, like a rack of lamb was $200. I'm like, oh, that's not going to happen. So I go, let's go let's go prudent and reasonable because Red Oak Keeper of the Amex would want me to be. Right. The meatloaf at the Cronenhaw. And it's just the meatloaf, not the carrots. 50 Swiss. $59.30 yeah. U.S. for the meatloaf. I think Tom's asking for I breakfast. I think he might be hungry. <laughs> I think that that's, that's the case. So <laughs> he keeps coming back to this. You're a little bit hungry. <clears throat> I don't know. Just a little bit. I was with this girl from Indiana and, oh, and here we she go. just oh, said, okay. okay, we'll have the same of that. Let's pause and, like, and maybe you can tell us about that story later. Dominic Constant and Mizuo is going to be with us a little bit later this morning. Next this. hour, this is Bloomberg. Yes. we waiting for that story. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, says he doesn't know if a Russian jet collision with an American spy drone near the Black Sea was intentional. But he says the U.S. has video evidence suggesting Russia's actions were aggressive. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Shogu, spoke yesterday in what appeared to be an effort to reduce tensions. Poland's defense minister says the country is in talks with Slovakia on transferring Soviet-era fighter jets to Ukraine. Earlier this week, Poland's premier said that a delivery could take place in the next four to six weeks. It's a move that would cross a threshold among NATO member states that have drawn the line at offering Kyiv air power. Emmanuel Macron's pension reforms face a final vote in the National Assembly today. If there's no agreement, the government could use the controversial Article 49.3 to pass the bill without a vote. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, former French President Francois Hollande said he's worried the ongoing strikes could deter foreign investors. The risk if there is a continuation of the social conflict beyond the passage of the law, even if I think that this risk is low, is that it could indeed dissuade investors from coming to France and give an image of France which is fairly consistent with prejudice. But I think that the government should focus precisely on finding forms of dialogue and opening a new phase discussion, in particular with the social partners and the most reformist trade union. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
if you do not manage your balance sheet well, if you don't manage your bank well, it, it, it will be a matter of time before you, you see trouble. I don't think it's a Lehman moment, by the way. I think that, that the, this is really bad, and of course it can get out of control, but I don't think that, that central banks or anyone else can just sit and watch this. The Saxo Bank founder and CEO, everyone's got a view on this situation right now. Credit Suisse, a good morning to you. Credit Suisse looks a little something like this. It's up by about 23% in Swiss trading after tapping the SMB for 50 billion Swiss franc overnight. We're back to about 210 on Credit Suisse's stock. This from JP Morgan a little bit earlier. Here's the quote. We see SMB liquidity support as indicated last night as not enough. We believe the situation is about ongoing market confidence issues with its IB strategy and ongoing franchise erosion. One, a complex IB restructuring with limited details. Two, ongoing deposit and net new asset outflows, although moderated year to date still an issue, clearly. And three, wealth management historically generating an average of 1.8 billion Swiss pre tax, but currently loss making. In our view, their view, the status quo is no longer an option. They offer a range of scenarios, Tom, <clears throat> over at JP Morgan. This is the investment bank on the south side, one of the analysts out there. Here's one of the options, takeover scenario, UBS, likely the uh, leading candidate. Culturally, it's got to be. I mean, we're making jokes about this this restaurant in uh, Zurich. It's not funny in Zurich, John. It's a two-bank town with a lot of private banks, but there's a heritage there that you just feel in the air. And to be honest, these majority shareholders, including Saudi Arabia central bank money, they want to come in and acquire that air, and that's what they thought they did, and profitability. I we are at that stage where this is part of the conversation. I want to tell them what people would think about, say, Julius Baer. Do they really want to go to one monster bank? in Switzerland, or do they want to boost up Julius Baer, beef that up and have some kind of combination? But as I say, yeah. this is all highly speculative yeah. stuff right now and stuff the well, C-suite at Credit Suisse doesn't even want us discussing because ultimately they want to get through this. They really want to get you, through this. You, just to be honest here, I'm the amateur here. John, you spent a lot more time there with Manus Cranny and, and Francine than I have. I mean, the new Zurich is different, as Lisa mentioned, from the stereotype of years ago. Yet we're Americans, particularly, I think, we have a baggage of the stereotype. But this conversation with this bank, Tom, <clears throat> I often tell the story about going over to see Brady Dugan when he ran the bank, I think more than 10 years I, ago. I know where you're going now, with this. But you're... About a decade ago, and the same questions were asked about the investment bank then. And I, here we are. I, I, it has been a decade-plus train wreck, I would, I would say that. Let's do this. What we've really tried to do overnight in this special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance is not find people, blah, blah, blah. Boy, is there enough of that going out there? We're trying to avoid that. And we do that by finding people that have the experience. Micah Kunz is with Luzerner Canton Bank. They are in Lucerne, and it's a big deal in Switzerland to have these separate Canton banks, which are the heritage and fabric. He has done tours of duty extensively at the Union Bank of Switzerland and also at Credit Suisse. Mr. Kunz joins us this morning. Michael, thank you so much for coming on. Can you imagine UBS and Credit Suisse? You've worked at both. Can you imagine them merging? Um, frankly speaking, no. Um, the competition authorities uh, would have a problem um, and the complexity of the merger is uh, just uh, too large to be surmounted. Uh, that's a very <coughs> complex task with overlapping wealth management in all sectors, uh, in, in all regions. Um, people that have been banking with Credit Suisse so far have deliberately not been banking with UBS and vice versa. And a merger of those two would see a ton of merger related guy in the tradition. Michael, one of the great heritage we've seen, we talked about this, I believe it was yesterday, is traditional EU executive management. And then, for example, at Deutsche Bank, Mr. Saving came in to save the day with a more verbal, more outgoing management. Is the major challenge at Credit Suisse is they're working under an old EU model? and they need a new executive regime to create action to fix this crisis? Um, that's probably one factor uh, of, of, of the whole bundle of problems. I mean, they have had quite a few management changes the last couple of years, but ultimately each new uh, leader has just reshuffled some org charts in the PowerPoint presentation. 
and the the strategic setup of the bank has not really been altered uh, sufficiently. Michael. And it's they need to get something moving. Uh, it's still not clear what this bank is supposed to look like in two or three years' time. Michael, we've talked a lot about how banks in the U.S. and even in France have tried to immunize themselves from uh, potential difficulties at Credit Suisse. They've spent a couple of months doing so. Is Credit Suisse still systemically important from your vantage point? Um, it's one of those big to fail banks still uh, for a country like Switzerland, uh, even though the bulk of the business is outside Switzerland. And it's nobody wants to take the risk uh, that this giant ultimately collapses. So that's why the SB did this preemptive strike. Um, with the additional liquidity facilities, even though the fundamental ratios uh, are still looking normal at Credit Suisse. But the market was wondering how much more outflows does it take before they cease to look normal. Michael, there's also a discussion about where the deposits are from, where the client base is from that use Credit Suisse and whether that makes it very difficult for a U.S. bank or even certain European <coughs> banks to take over or merge with Credit Suisse, given that there's a large base of Middle Eastern and Chinese investors that become kind of difficulty in a different kind of transparency regime. What's your view on that? It would be a certain challenge, uh, to, to put it mildly. I mean, uh, people have all sorts of options where they can do their wealth management or private banking in Asia. Uh, the, the big Singapore banks, uh, for example, uh, are, are an important player. And if somebody chooses uh, to be with a Swiss bank, um, I'm not sure he's 100% comfortable if this tomorrow would be a French bank. Michael Kunz, I want to finish on this just briefly. We talked Sunday evening after the action in the United States. Was that sufficient? Do you see the move overnight from Swiss authorities together with Credit Suisse as sufficient? Or do you think that's just a Band-Aid? Uh, that depends on a lot of different factors. I mean, are markets, uh, equity markets further collapsing uh, or are they kind of stabilizing because collapsing equity markets erode the revenue base for Credit Suisse? I think for the moment it's quite a big statement and um, it kind of should slow down uh, people who are pondering upon withdrawing their money at, at Credit Suisse. Uh, but ultimately, I would say Credit Suisse is not out of the woods yet. Michael, thank you, sir, for your perspective. Michael Kunz there on what's happening with Credit Suisse at the moment. It's up about 23%. <clears throat> One of the options that the investment bank at JP Morgan suggested on the research side of things, that the SMB could step in with a full deposit guarantee on all deposits. Just a range of options out there, Tom, that people are still discussing this morning. The range of options. Well, we started there. Mr. Heimers was out yesterday, you know, obviously with UBS at a distance from this debacle. And I, I, I am struck by people that actually have experienced this are just no way you could see a UBS Credit Suisse merger. And I just find that bizarre. I mean, Really? Why, why couldn't that happen? And I never had a straight answer. Well, would you want just one major bank? Oh, no, you don't want one, but you don't have a choice right now. When you're overcome by country. events, yeah, absolutely. But it's just they just say that it's unthinkable that they could see them merge, and I would like to know why. What's more unthinkable, a tie-up between the two beasts of Switzerland or a foreigner buying the bank? I, I don't have the answer to that other than people are quite forceful that they really don't want the Americans to come in. That's what I hear, too. Yeah. So, you know, I it's a mystery. I also hear that the Americans don't want to come in. So that's another issue is that they don't <clears throat> want the assets. This issue, though, that J.P. Morgan uh, raise, raises here, which is they can't do nothing because they have to shore up confidence. And it's not just avoiding people leaving in terms of clients. Why would they stay in terms of the reach, in terms of the talent retention, in terms of what they can potentially offer? Do you remember Tijan Tiam? Do you remember yes. his time at the bank? Yeah. That seems calm compared to, to this, and but that was anything but calm. You mentioned Mr. Dugan earlier. I'm sorry. This has been a, because of where we are with the bond dynamic and the central bank dynamic, that we, we've, we've, ex, we've come to a crescendo of 10 years. Equity futures right now, unchanged on the S&P, Credit Suisse, higher.
Live from New York City, good morning to you. Equities, negative, just Credit Suisse, the one to watch. That stock is bouncing today by more than 23%. Of 23% after putting out a statement overnight. Keep going back to it, just 1.45 a.m. in Zurich. These guys have been up all night announcing that they're going to tap 50 billion Swiss from the SNB, the Swiss National Bank. <clears throat> going to rebuy some debt, repurchase some debt as well. Is that enough? Is that sufficient? The stock is higher by 24%, but basically still in and around two Swiss franc, two Swiss franc per share on the stock. Elsewhere, I'm looking at futures, just slightly negative on the S&P, no drama here on equities on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ, Lisa mentioned this the other day, yield to lower, NASDAQ up. It's just sort of like <laughs> reflexive. Never mind the earnings wow. story. Who knows? OK, the NASDAQ up a third of 1%. We're going to get to the bond market. Your two-year looks like this, up 14 basis points on a two-year, 4.02%. It was sat the four a little bit earlier. This two-year note's been all over the place going into the Fed next week. The ECB coming up a little bit later. But let's finish on this name right here. <laughs> First Republic. Now, this is tricky stuff. <clears throat> First Republic, down 16% in the pre-market. Now, we've reported that they're weighing options, including a potential sale, Tom. That stock down in the pre-market and not looking great, is it? There are two stories out there, and it's the way this is going down, John. This is not like Credit Suisse yesterday rolling over as the bid walked away. Technical analysis doesn't matter here. Five, I can give you the exact time in the Bloomberg, uh, John. This is East Coast time for those of you worldwide. About 5.50 a.m. down right now. That was 30, 30, 40 minutes ago. And a new leg down just moments ago, John, as you highlighted that here at 6.20, eight minutes ago, boom. I want to down. go through some details from our reporting from Gillian Tan and Matthew <coughs> Monks. They say that First Republic, which of course was cut to junk by S&P Global Ratings and Fitch just yesterday, is exploring strategic options, including a sale, according to people with knowledge of the matter. Now, there's tons of speculation about the positions of individual banks, then we have to let the statements of these individual banks be heard as well. First Republic on Sunday said this, that it had more than $70 billion in unused liquidity to fund operations from agreements that included the Federal Reserve and JP Morgan. And yet still, Lisa, this stock is still struggling. This is what S&P wrote in their downgrade to junk. By the way, uh, you know, in terms of pile on, this is quite the thing when S&P and Fitch come out right after you've already seen uh, some of the drama in the markets. We believe the risk of deposit outflows is elevated at First Republic Bank, despite the actions of federal banking regulators and the bank actively increasing its borrowing availability to mitigate risks associated with bank failures over the past week. Basically, the hysteria around the potential failure of small and medium-sized banks has a snowball effect that means that S&P and Fitch don't have confidence that this can be considered an investment-grade bank. And a bank without an investment-grade rating, very difficult when it is county party risk and it is credibility at the fore. I'll be honest. I ignore the ratings. I think they're always behind. They're behind, behind, behind. There's something else going on here. And it looks to me like Sunday uh, with Silicon Valley where there's speculation about who's going to acquire this bank. And many people say this is the one bank, John, that has a value, has a sense of corpus, a oneness to it that could be acquired. And you've got to look at the share price action and say there's things we don't know that are not good. I think what you just said, Tom, probably resonates <clears throat> with a lot of people. They don't care about the ratings either. Unfortunately, there are some investors out there that have to care. They have to care, yes, yes. It's rated because it dictates where they allocate capital. And the problem I think a lot of you might have at home listening to some of this is you've heard a million people this year already, year to date, say USIG. I like US investment grade credit. And Lisa, you've also heard a lot of people say this. The U.S. banking sector is resilient. It's really strong. And they said the same thing over the last week. Fact of the matter is the names we're talking about a week ago were investment grade. They were IG not so long ago. There's a theory, there's a saying that the crisis always happens in debt or in instruments that are perceived as safe. That is where usually crises stem from. And that, I think, is the concern. When suddenly there's risk in areas that people thought were truly risk-free, that becomes very problematic for broader market confidence. And so First Republic in the pre-market down about 15, <clears throat> let's call it 16%. One eye on Credit Suisse for you all morning, up 25.6% mm. at the moment, Thomas Swiss Trading. So Credit Suisse has done better. I've got that up here, and it has more technological veracity to it. And the answer is a nice spike and then a real surprise, sell-off errors people exited two, three hours ago. And, John, we've ramped up here over 30 minutes, over 50 minutes. Feels like a lifetime until the ECB decision, doesn't it? 
Yes. It, it really yes. does. I think we're three hours and ten minutes away well, from a news conference. Well, we from President Lagarde. Okay. What we're going to do right now is talk to a bond expert. Ian Lingen has a note that everyone reads on the street with BMO Capital Markets. And this, we're going to break ranks today and not talk so much bonds with Mr. Lingen, but how he folds central bank action into what to do with bonds that you own or that you want to acquire. Ian Lingen, you take great precedence here that Lagarde will speak before Powell. What are the ramifications that the ECB is out front of a Fed March 22nd? I think that this is the first time in recent memory where we can look at the ECB and really take a cue for what that might mean for the Fed next week. It would have been one thing had it been a limited banking crisis to the U.S. only, but the fact that Credit Suisse is now impacted means that the ECB is facing effectively the exact same decision that the Fed will be next week. So we'll be looking at what's already priced in, which is more than a 25 basis point rate hike, as an opportunity for one way or another someone mm -hmm. to be disappointed this morning. Is Credit Suisse, and for that matter, First Republic, different from Silicon Valley Bank? Are these balance sheet crises or income statement crises, Ian? I can characterize it more as a baseline confidence crisis. It's more about if it can be contained and isolated, we won't have a problem as a system. But as it seems now, we have gone, this is now the fifth bank in the process that is under pressure, and it's overseas as well as domestically. I think that regulators and monetary policymakers are going to be very apprehensive about the next two or three weeks. Jay Barry at JP Morgan says, locking the gains in treasuries, they're going to keep hiking. Ian, what do you say back to that? Certainly in the front end of the market, particularly the two-year sector, when we dip below 4%, that's implying a great deal of caution on the part of the Fed. A pause should certainly be on the table next week, although, as I mentioned, the ECB will probably set the, the broader tone. But even if there was a pause, it wouldn't be terminal per se. There would be some symmetry around the risk going forward. Very conceivable for, Fed, for the Fed to pause, but at the same time, increase the dot plot for 2023, which implies restarting later in the year. Has the Fed lost credibility, though, in all the dot plots and the SEPs and all of the other issues that they try to forecast something that is unforecastable at a moment when the market's moving, whether, whether the Fed does or not? I think that this is a unique episode for the Fed because of the proximity to terminal, i.e., we're close enough that the Fed probably knows exactly where they're going to end the process. It would be different if we were having this conversation this time last year when there were still a um, a large number of hikes yet to be realized. So if nothing else, I think the market will look at the SCP and the dot plot and say, OK, Powell probably knows exactly what the plan is at this point. Ian, I'd love your sense of the technicals underpinning the bond market right now. We talked about how the implied volatility right now in Treasury yields is the greatest going back to December 2008. Does this highlight to you a fragility in the market structure of the deepest, most liquid market in the world? I would say that I had bigger liquidity concerns and was more worried about the overall function of the Treasury market during the fourth quarter when we saw a lot of strains in a variety of different sectors. But given that we are where we are in the monetary policy cycle and there's a broader sense of stability, and we've actually seen a lot of sideline investors come back into the market, whether that is was during the month of January or even in the most recent week, I think that we're back in a reasonably comfortable position from a liquidity and a market structure perspective, at least. But we are facing a great deal of uncertainty. And when, you're, when one is facing uncertainty in financial markets, buying treasuries is a reasonable knee-jerk response. And just to be really clear, do you think it's a mistake for these central banks to isolate what's happening in the financial system from the monetary policy decision they've got to make today and next week? I would say that it is unwarranted to separate the two at the moment. Taking a breather on the rate hike process is 
is prudent. I think that would make sense, but that doesn't mean that's what they're going to do. So I think it's very yeah. much up in the air at this stage. Well, I think you're very honest. That's the problem. No one really knows. Ian Lingen there of BMO Capital Markets. Ian mentioned something, though, that goes with something we were all told last night from someone much smarter than me, at least, who turned around and said, Chair Powell and President Lagarde have probably, probably spoken to each other in the last 24 hours, which is why people like Ian think that you can infer what the Fed's <clears> going to do from what ultimately leads to the ECB ends up doing this afternoon. I love that because usually people say Jerome Powell, central banker to the world, the Federal Reserve leading the rest of the world. Now it's the ECB leading the Federal Reserve, which would be really uh, notable. I can't imagine what that conversation would have been like, though. I don't know what to do, do you? I have no clue. <laughs> you go, go first. You. Yeah, go ahead. So I'll be watching. You go first this morning, 9.15 Eastern do, Time. Yeah, Just do. want to be careful yeah. on the time if you are stateside because of the clock changes in the last weekend. 9.15 Eastern Time is when you get that ECB decision. 9.45 is when... Tom, they don't get that change news conference. daylight savings when we do? No, a couple that. of weekends oh. after. Yeah. When is the meeting today? So you're going to get the decision at 9.15 Eastern, and then 9.45, I believe, you get the news conference. You got no, that? No one told me. I've been, I think like, I've you know, minutes away. At least I went through it twice. Okay. Yeah, right. once at five, and I think again at six. There we are. <laughs> Coordinated central bank response is something they do. It's in the research, and they don't talk about it. No. She's going to get a question today. Of course. She'll go, how about how about that Formula One race? You know, that's what she's going to say. You she's think they're talking about Jetta this weekend? I think they're talking I, I about Jetta so. or Ferrari. But, you know, what they're going to really talk about here is is what they're – I, I know exactly what Lagarde's going to do. Christine Lagarde is going to go, how do I get through this and do no harm? That's exactly how she's going to We're do it. We're not here to close spreads. <clears throat> we are, yeah. That was that was a good one, wasn't it? I mean, no, the point but is. Tom, yeah, that's the simple one. Do no harm. But Lisa, yeah. what does more harm? Right. Hiking or not hiking? This is the question. I mean, what does it even mean to do no harm? What are you trying to push the market? Which direction are you trying to push it in, honestly? I, I, you know, First Republic 30 minutes ago, 40 minutes ago, was actually pretty stable, gone under 26 now, down from that 31 level. I, we are in the crisis now, and that means central bankers don't act. That's the guess. We're down 17% on First Republic. <clears throat> Credit Suisse this morning. Good morning to you. Positive 26% over in Swiss trading from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Credit Suisse surged the most on record after tapping the Swiss National Bank for a $54 billion loan and offering a repurchase of $3.2 billion worth of debt. Meanwhile, Credit Suisse's top shareholder says panic around the bank's financial stocks is unwarranted. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has unveiled a $22 billion a year fiscal stimulus in his first budget statement, easing the belt tightening he was forced to announce last year. Among the most expensive measures were plans to extend free child care support, tax breaks for business investments and extra military spending. Social media stocks rallied in post-market trading following reports the U.S. government may ban TikTok. Now, sources say the U.S. has told the app's Chinese parent, ByteDance, they must sell their shares or face a ban. The U.S. has raised concerns over China's influence over the app. TikTok says divestment won't resolve any national security concerns. And Virgin Orbit is said to be halting its operations and furloughing nearly all staff due to funding issues. Bloomberg sources say the company is planning an operational pause. Earlier this year, its first launch out of the UK failed to reach orbit in a mishap blamed on a faulty fuel filter. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think with Credit Suisse on the table, they will pause. I think they should pause. I think hiking rates, either the ECB hiking rates this week or the Fed hiking rates next week has 
the potential to be the greatest gaffe since the ECB hiked rates in June 2008. Is this a triche moment for the ECB all over again? Bob Michael at JP Morgan, Asset Management, the CIO. TK, what do you make of that? I am a, I, mean, I think it's no secret to anybody. I'm 100% on page with them. The only thing I would change there is it would be the greatest gaffe since the Red Sox traded Mookie Wilson. M Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts. Away. The LA Dodgers. And not just away, but also 2011, the ECB <clears throat> also hiked then. And, and this is just Lisa and I, John, twice. Lisa and I were talking, <laughs> Lisa and I were talking in this a break while you were out at the catered breakfast that we've got in uh, this morning. And the, and the answer is uh, they've learned their lessons. Why is First Republic Bank? I mean, give me the quote, John. I don't know where it we're is. We're down right 17 now. right now, down 17%. Yeah, you know, we're, we're breaching down a new, new weakness on First Republic Bank. Everybody's learned, Lisa, from 08. Well, and from the other crises. So Bespoke Investment put out this chart yesterday <clears throat> where they were looking at the gap, the yield curve of three-month and two-year Treasury yields. And it's the most inverted, or it was the most inverted at one point over the past couple of days going back to 2001. The last time this happened, the Federal Reserve came out and cut by 50 basis points in a surprise move the next day. Just to give you a sense of what the market is basically signaling here. Important asterisks. The caveat. Where was CPI? <laughs> yeah. This is the problem. It's right? the We're, big problem we, for we, them, right? Yeah, this is the reason why, you know, Nouriel Rubini had a good point, where they're kind of stuck, where they still have to be thinking about inflation. I'll say it once, twice, three, four, five times. I'll keep saying it. <clears throat> there are no good decisions today. No, it is the... There, you're there, trying... Really, there really aren't, this, and I don't think it yeah. matters, you know. <clears throat> it's sport to beat up on central banks. I love playing the game too, but today, next week... <laughs> It doesn't matter what they do, there will be a reason to criticize yeah. them for whatever they've done. I'm going to channel Mohammed Alarian on this, and this is game theory where there's no good decisions, so you're trying to ascertain good people with real-time dynamics, including flows out of banks, are trying to ascertain the best, worst outcome. And, and that's tough to do. Let's drive the conversation forward, and we do this with someone hugely qualified. Sandra Philippin is chief economist at ABN AMRO. Dr. Philippin is out of Erasmus, which means she has a huge understanding of European banking history. As an economist, Sandra, with your knowledge of European banking history, what should Christine Lagarde do in the 9 o'clock U.S. hour this morning? Yeah, thanks, Tom, for those um, yeah, pretty remarkable compliments that you're making here. Um, that's overdoing it a bit, <clears throat> actually. But, um, uh, well, nobody knows what, what she should be doing, actually. And um, I have been listening to your comments uh, in the last few minutes on the table. And um, I don't necessarily agree with what you're saying, because... Um, well, if you just try to decompose the problem a little bit, um, looking at Credit Sui, I think the most fundamental metric that matters at this point is the um, total loss absorption capacity uh, uh, in terms of its RWA, and that is at 40% right now. Um, and that is way above the 20, 25%, uh, 20 mm -hmm. or 25% that is, that is demanded from the Swiss uh, regulation. So I think that um, a lot of uh, drama is going around in, uh, in headlines at this moment. Um, and so actually, I do think that the ECB has one thing very clearly in sight, and that is that it still has a core inflation problem. Um, it still has a macro resilience uh, that right. is lasting longer than expected. <clears throat> and it has its previous commentary about um, going on for longer beyond March. And, you know, to turn all of that around, while at the same time we're always worrying about uh, not being led by, uh, by markets, um, I think right. gives me a little bit of confidence that, that she will be going ahead with her plan. Interesting. Well, that's a, it's a, there's many different opinions out there right now, to say the least. Sandra, with that said... And with the idea that Credit Suisse has financial integrity, they still got to go out and do business. Will there be a European nominal GDP spirit that can get Credit Suisse, Switzerland, and all of Europe through this crisis? Do you see an oomph to the European economy? Um, yeah, that's a hard. That's actually a really hard question to answer, Tom. But I think that. 
um, the resilience uh, in the uh, European banking sector is bigger um, than probably markets are expecting right now. And I think that if you look at, for example, the uh, ECB stress test uh, on uh, fast deepening or fast flattening of, of the curves that has been done basically uh, showed uh, a resilient picture. And, um, you know, if you want to look at the least resilient uh, uh, geo geographic geographies in, in Europe, it, it was uh, Luxembourg and Italy. But even that was not dramatic. So I think that um, for now, I think this turmoil will settle. Uh, and yeah, I think the ECB will continue on its path. So just to be clear, just quickly, Sandra, just in a word, 50 today, is that your call? Just yes or no? Yes. Amazing. Sandra Flippin there yeah. of ABN Ambro. Thank you. She's not alone, Tom. Well, this ECB is the ECB basically no. pre-committed to it. Some people think they'll do it. And our job isn't to form the debate. Our job is to listen to the debate, and that's yeah. it. Bob Michael and Sandra Philippin are on two separate planets, which is what makes it interesting. Well, I actually, I think they're on similar planets because Bob is saying it would be a terrible decision. He just doesn't know ultimately what they will do. So Bob's been very clear about what he thinks they should yeah. do. He just does can, not know what they will Can I, can will I throw do. something out here? Does Jerome Powell have the luxury of really not being visible till March 22nd? I mean, we're lucky in that Christine Lagarde, two days into this crisis, is visible. I'll give her that. Does he have to come out and make an appearance? The problem for, for Jay Powell right now is there's also a bit of scrutiny about their ability to oversee the financial system because of some of the missteps at Silicon Valley Bank and the San Francisco Fed having some relationship with it. So there is this sort of dual question of how are they sort of shoring up their oversight of small, medium-sized businesses at the same time that they're trying to, you know, actuate some sort of uh, monetary policy at a very difficult time. It is a very difficult moment for him. Yeah, and there's also some criticism about how they oversee themselves as well, yes. as overseeing <clears throat> other institutions. Yes. And, and Senator Warren's got things yeah. to say about that. Tom, down 22% on First Republic. Can we free frame market. it? 31. John was ahead of me on this story. What, two drops. We've now got a new leg drop to 24. The low two days ago was a 17 handle. I didn't. This was for a cup of coffee. It was a good cup of coffee, but it was a cup of coffee, John. We're at 24.13, more than halfway back easily to that 17.5. I'm afraid low. that Tom, I don't have anything new to add, <clears throat> apart from my reporting yesterday evening. Gillian Tan, Matthew Monk said this, that First Republic, after the cuts to junk by S&P Global and Fitch Ratings just yesterday, were exploring strategic options, including a sale, according to people with knowledge of the matter. And I'll go back to the statement from the bank on Sunday that it had more than $70 billion in unused liquidity, Lisa, to fund operations from agreements that included the Fed and, and JP Morgan, too. Well, this is according to Joseph Wang, who out on Twitter is known as the Fed guy. He used to work at the Federal Reserve, and he put out this a couple days ago. One reason why First Republic looks like it's imploding could be because it actually can't benefit from the Fed's new bailout facility, that basically they don't own the Treasury Agency MBS to yes. post as collateral. Yes. This is the type yes. of balance sheet analysis that people are looking I, at. So they're clearly out of the regime that's been set up by the uh, federal authorities. We need to be careful about conflating income statement flow and critically trust analysis with balance sheet analysis. I think everybody involved here has got great balance sheets, including Credit Suisse bailed out by SMB John at what? 1.45 a.m. in the morning, the dark of night? Great. But the answer is that's got nothing to do with this present unique and different crises between these separate banks. This particular situation, though, I think people are looking at this and saying, OK, well, the Fed's offered this issue. The FDIC has offered this program. What can different banks do to potentially access it? And I think people are going and looking bank by bank to understand well, what the protections are. I, I remember the moment when we were stunned that James Diamond showed up to uh, go 1-800-BSC. And as, as Matt Levine says brilliantly today, they all learned their lesson. And where is the Jamie Dimon to show up for Silicon Valley? Didn't it happen. I don't want to speculate on FRC right now. That would be rude. But who's going to show up on FRC, John? Another leg lower. HSBC, they showed up. We're down more than 30% on First Republic in the pre-market. Let's call it negative 32 on my screen right now. More coverage of this still to come. Fantastic guest in the next hour. Don't miss this. Former vice chair of the Federal Reserve, currently of PIMCO. Rich Clarida, just around the corner, 30 minutes away. <clears throat>